Hi, I'm Rebecca Oles of Time Smith Dressmaking. Welcome back to my channel. Today I have something very special for you. As part of the CoCovid weekend event, bringing together customers from all over the world for an extravaganza of four days of non-stop costuming treats. I'm delighted to be joined today by Myrta of Atelier Nostalgia. She is an academic and historical costume with a special love of traditional Dutch costume. And her costume activities can be found under the name Atelier Nostalgia on most social media, so do go check that out. But today we're going to be talking about chintz. This is a special research interest of Myrta's, so she's going to share uh, a lot of what she has found out about its history and how it was worn and used in particularly the 18th century, but its history does go back further than that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Myrta uh, to talk about chintz. Hi, Myrta, how are you? I'm very good, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, Why did you accept then, it? Yeah, I'm very happy uh, to sort of join in in, in the Coco Fit um, shenanigans. Yes. Um, and, and share a little of, of what I found out um, over the years um, about the, this lovely fabric, right? Um, so I, I love talking about it, so thank you for having me. So I think something that's good to start with is, is like, what is chint actually? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people might have heard of it, um, have some idea in their head of, of what it is and what it looks like. Um, so the definition that I want to use here um, really goes back to the origins. Um, and if you go back, then chintz is a common fabric, um, which is either hand painted or block printed. Um, with natural dyes using a combination of mordant and resist dye techniques. Um, over the years, that, that definition have, has sort of changed from its origins, which really were about how it was made, into more of what it looked like, mm. um, which is this beautiful floral printed cotton, um, which is often the, the image that we get when we look at it today. Um, but of course, when we think about it, when the people who were making this fabric also in the past, they were not just making florals, they were making a lot of other things as well. It's just that what came to Europe and what, what the, that what got the name chins at some point was mostly floral. Um, but the name really goes back, like the, the, the definition I just used really goes back to how it was made. Um, and that's such an integral part uh, of the story that I figured I would start there. Yes, please. Um, so the origins of chins lie in India um, and they go back for centuries. Um, India has been producing cotton for, for a very long time and the, over the centuries they developed techniques that were superior to almost anything else that was being made in the world when it comes to printed and painted cottons. So most of the chintzes that we see coming to Europe in the, in the beginning of, um, well, starting really in the 16th century and then the 17th, 18th century gaining popularity were hand painted mm. um, with special types of pens. And some of them were block printed, but that's a bit rarer. And it's really this process that, that took a lot of craftsmanship and, and went through a lot of stages. Um, so they started with very high quality cotton fabric. Mm -hmm. Um, which was bleached and then they started with the outlines, the stems for instance in, in the darker color which is the darkish brown almost black which you often see the lines of, of being made of. That was a mordant and this is sort of a technical term but mordants are basically um, a chemical substance, substance naturally of course but it, it has this chemical reaction with the fabric which makes it more susceptible to taking dye. Uh, so what they would do is they wouldn't necessarily dye the fabric with the dyes that they were using, but they would paint the fabric with the mordant and then put it in a bath with dye. And then everything that was painted before would actually take the color. Uh, and the reds and these dark browns were made in this way. So they would start with these dark brown in, in sort of an iron, which immediately also gave some of its color. And then for the reds, they would paint it with different types of, of mordant for different shades of red and then they would submerge it into a dye bath. It would come out, it would then need to be bleached because everything would be slightly yellowish 
Oh, right, yeah. Um, so it would need to be washed and bleached. And then the second step after you've done the reds would be the blues. Um, and blue was often done with indigo. And the thing with indigo is that it do does actually directly present this very lovely color, but that means if you put it into a dye bath, everything turns blue. <laughs> so that is, is where the resist dye comes in. And that oh, means- Is that resist that. dye? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they would, everything that was not supposed to be blue would be covered in a sort of wax. Okay. Um, and that's again a very specialized process because it needs to be very flexible because they would fold up the fabric and it would need to hold because otherwise if you got cracks you could have these little lines of blue yes. which you do sometimes see in original fabrics and I, I love seeing those, these little veins because it means that something went wrong in, in, in the process it sort of trays back to its roots but then it would go into the indigo bath it would everything that was not covered in wax um, would would turn blue it will be taken out again, treated again, um, and then finally it will be the yellows. So they, they have three main colors, the reds, the blues, and the yellows. And the yellows were also used to make greens to, right. by painting over the yellows on top of the blues. Yellow was basically the only of the three which were, was applied directly, um, just oh. as we would think of painting fabric, <laughs> putting paint on fabric. Um, it was also the one that was least resistant to light and it would fade most. Oh. So in a lot of tints today, it can be the yellow would have faded more than the reds and the blues. So sometimes something might look blue today while it was more green, um, more green in the period. Of course, green was the most difficult to achieve because yes. it needs two steps. So you need more, co more colors, it's a more involved process, but green was definitely there. Um, a lot of the leaves are, are green, and, and there's still some some chances which have very vibrant, even green grounds. So the background would be completely True. green. True. Um, so it was definitely done. Okay. It was just as main colors you see more red and blue, sure. and then green was for mostly and most chances was more for the accents, but definitely also our perception probably is influenced a bit by the fact that the yellow has faded most. Um, so some of the green might have disappeared over time, maybe with some kind of chemical analysis they could trace that back, but um, that would really be specialized work. So after all this dyeing, they had some, some specific like treatments and bleaching, which really meant that these fabrics kept color really, really well, and that they were very, very vibrant. And that's also what the fabric was loved for so much. Mm. Some of these processes, I believe, they still don't fully understand how it works today. Mm. Um, let alone where, when they were doing it, and, and these just build up over the centuries. And some chins, you also find some gold and silver leaf, which I just wanted to mention because it's so special. <laughs> um, and we don't see it that much in, in European chins because it was mostly reserved for the nobles in India itself. Yeah. So chins was made in India, but it was a lot of it was transported to all over the world. Um, but most of the chins in Europe wouldn't have been have gold or silver on it, but there were some, some people sneaked in some pieces at some point, of course. <laughs> um, and they move, they catch the light when you move and it's, uh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Right? Wow. So this is sort of the background of, of how it's made. Okay. Um, and the reason I, I wanted to use that definition is because we have this very clear picture of floral cotton mm. when we think of chins and that's the european perception of chins because that was what was made for european market but of course it comes from india mm. and the people there would have named it after the process mm. rather than the motifs because they made things for all over the world they made things for different markets in different places. Um, and they had been doing so for a long time before the European showed up. And not all of it was floral. There's also more, more abstract and, and geometrical motifs that, that people were making. So I think that, that that definition does more right to sort of the history of it rather than just the European view of, of what it is and what we imagine it to be. Yes, it seems it was a world fabric and, and so we need a world view. Yeah, exactly. You, you get chins in, in different regions. So, so going back to, I think, the 10th century in Egypt, they found prints, mm. cotton prints, which were made in India. 
And by the time the Europeans showed up, um, like I said, the Portuguese came in India first in the 16th century, they really found a market that already existed, a trade network that already existed. Mm. Um, and what most, uh, most traders were really looking for were spices. Yeah. Um, so they went to Indonesia mostly for, for spices, and that, that's the case for the Dutch, but I think to some extent also for the English uh, yes. and the Portuguese, who were the most prominent traders yes. um, in the 17th to 16th, 17th century. And they found that actually these Indonesians didn't really care that much for all their gold and their silver. They wanted these Indian fabrics, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, because they knew about it and it had been a part of their culture as well. Um, and India was making things specifically for that market. Mm. The way chins ended up in Europe is very much about almost accident. Yes. They bought it in India because they wanted the spices in Indonesia. Couldn't lose everything. Just brought home whatever they had left. And people loved it here. Um, and slowly, um, in India, the workshops also started to work for, for what they call your call European taste in a mm -hmm. way. European chins in the way the, the what we see was really made for Europe. We see it as this exotic fabric, which it mm. was, and, and people viewed it as such. Um, but it was made for Europeans with Europeans yes. in mind. Um, and people would bring descriptions or pictures, um, paintings to India to show to, the, to these, mostly the middlemen, because there were middlemen between the, the, the traders and, and the craftsmen often. And they say, well, can you make something like this? Um, and then you, for instance, get in, in the early 18th centuries, you see these tintes which really resembled the bizarre silks of the time. Really? Wow. With, the, with these really big stylized floral but almost weird type of patterns yes whereas later on if you go on in time the chins also becomes less baroque and more rococo yes so the, <laughs> and that was not because the fashion. indians evolved their taste no. <laughs> <laughs> so so what it looks like is really this this interesting mix of indian craftsmanship and european ideas of exoticism Mm -hmm. mixed with their their European taste and that's what really brought these patterns to life so the, the narrative of India and it, it changes of course later in time but it's mm. the, of course the trading agencies they they were there to trade they were there for the money but it also meant they wanted a monopoly and yes. then it became political of course, yes because to, to have a monopoly you need power yeah um, so they weren't just the innocent traders there no. but I also don't like to see these craftsmen as victims especially at this stage in time because they were very good at what they did and they were very savvy um, and they had the trade secrets and no one else could imitate or come close to what they could make. It's, yeah. it's an interesting point that it, it was a very valuable commodity that gave yeah gave rise to eventually the kind of greed and exploitation but at this point yeah. in time these indian craftsmen were not being exploited this was their thing i mean the europeans used existing political structures and they yeah. played them out again against each other they right? so they, so they weren't they weren't innocent in that sense but i also don't like i said i don't like to, to paint them as as victims at this stage no because they were very specialized and skilled craftsmanship and their product was valued mm. um, enough and of course what it leads into is this global textile trade yes which then the european powers say hey um, can we do this cheaper can we do this ourselves and that leads to the cotton plantations mm. in the americas and yes leads into the slave trade so yes. it's it's directly related but yes, it's slightly it before effect. this absolutely yes um, so you can sort of see the beginnings, but it's not quite the same story yet. So, yeah, so I think if, if you think about the whole story about colonialism, about cotton and about slavery, then chintz, feeds into that in mm. certain 
different ways. It's not fully the same story. And yet um, there's very clear relations and, and things that happen over time because other things have happened in the past, which means that there is a relationship there. So for the Dutch, the, the 17th century, so the century in which Chins really started coming in, in which the East India Trading Company was founded, um, it was also the, the the century in which the Netherlands became the Republic of the Netherlands and itself became free of Spain. <laughs> um, it's also the century in which the, the transatlantic slave trade started. And in the oh. Netherlands, there were two separate companies. The East Indian Trading Company was there. They went to India, well, come, got spices in Indonesia and came back. Um, and the West Indian Company were the ones who went to, to the West Coast of Africa traded the slaves to um to the locations they had in in the americas mostly for sugar at that yeah. point and then went back um the east indian trading company was a lot more successful financially but they were involved in both um but they were slightly separate now i don't think it's right to say that that makes the east indian trade trade company more morally superior to the west <laughs> one because they didn't trade in slaves because Trade was about monopoly and monopoly was about power. And this is sort of how the whole colonial story got started, right? Yeah. Um, in India itself, there were places where people were displaced and where wars were fought. Most wars were fought with the Portuguese who came there before. <laughs> um, but it was also a lot of co collaboration, cooperation with local um, power structures that were already in place and then they would pay taxes and trade for that. They could, you know, get some trade of the monopoly. Um, it wasn't always peaceful, but um, there were collaborations there. So the story of, of Chins there is that those workers were already making for different markets. They just had an extra market they could, could, um, could produce for. Um, and I think wealth-wise, um, that was not a bad thing. For, for the people who made these cottons. Okay. Um, that's the story of the 17th century, right? Then in the 18th century, sort of the, the, the heyday of the Dutch trading companies is really in the 17th century. And in the 18th century, that, that gradually declines until they go bankrupt. Um, the East Indian trading company goes bankrupt near the end of the century. I think the West Indian trading company goes bankrupt a couple of times. Um, but the story of cotton is also one that makes it, it popularizes it in the West. And that gives rise to industrial revolutions. Mm -hmm. People who started producing both, you know, the, the dyes and the printing um, in the printing factories here in Europe, which are sort of initially the cheap imitations. Um, but also at some point, because of this rise in, in a need for cotton, people start looking for other sources. At that point, the Dutch are not that involved anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the plantations that the Dutch have at that point are mostly in, in Suriname. Mm -hmm. And I believe those are mostly sugar. Um, I, I, again, for the morality of the story, it really doesn't matter whether it's cotton or sugar, there were still, still slave, slave holding plantations. Um, but to link it to, to chins, the Dutch were not that involved anymore. Of course, you do get, um, the plantations in the Americas at some point. Mm. And the want for cotton and the fact that this had become such uh, a prevalent fabric, partly largely because of chins, did feed into how much cotton then was worth and was worn and was wanted and, and fed into that whole industry. So the story of chins, I wouldn't say is necessarily one of, it's not one of slavery and it's, some one that's adjacent to um, colonialism, but for the Dutch, again, not quite because they just had these small trading posts, but everything that happens there feeds into the larger history yeah. and leads to other things. Um, and that's that's a link that I think is, is good to mention and be aware of. Um, and the reason that the Dutch was such a rich republic in the 17th century was because of this trade um and a lot of people did suffer over that as well right mm -hmm. um, so you can't fully separate that either um but it's a different century and 
the story of chance really in in the way we've been talking about it really ends around 1800 and from what i know of the common story in the us which to to be honest is is i want to learn a lot more about that mm -hmm. i don't know that much about it um but that really started around the same time in some in some ways that printed cotton story that is so intrinsically linked to the history of slavery that that cotton that that trade would not have developed the way it did if chintz hadn't been so loved no yeah um so it's it's really about there's a timeline there right yes. and things don't just prop up they they grow out of other yes. things and and i think that's where where chintz ties in because it's mm -hmm. the start of a lot of things i want to highlight how skilled these people were yes. right yeah um, and how how market savvy they were yes because they were very very good at making things for markets from all over the world so yeah. that they would local tastes would would like these these products that they made mm -hmm. and i think that's their um their skill that shows through that both as as craftsmen as as a businessman yeah and as, and european production methods at some point took over but it took mm. them years centuries <laughs> to get to, get to yes. the level that had had been developed in india yes so maybe we should talk a bit about chins in europe how it got there and what it yes sort of the timeline is so uh of course for, from my perspective i look at things mostly through dutch perspective mm -hmm. um so in that sense that's that's european perspective for mm. me that I feel that that makes sense because I am Dutch, I live in the Netherlands and, and that's sort of the way I look at this fabric. I think everyone in the Netherlands who knows anything about chins knows it's Indian origins, yes. right? Um, and yet it has strangely become also this very Dutch thing because it at some point took over a very prominent place in traditional costume and Dutch mm. traditional costume would not have looked the way it looked now without these global trade networks. So it started like, like I mentioned before, a little. It started sort of in the 16th century with the Portuguese um, who came to India, mostly to the um, the West Coast, mm -hmm. I believe. And the first chintzes sort of already appeared on the scene in the late 16th century. Um, we tend to really think of it as this 18th century thing, but it has such a long history. Um, and it's really sort of the late 17th century that the the big Sort of the, the cotton craze mm. <laughs> really starts in Europe. Um, this is sort of the heyday also of the Dutch East, uh, East India Trading Company, um, also of the English trading towards India. And this is when it starts to really, really catch on. Yeah. And initially, mostly in home decor things. Oh, right. we, we, of course, from coming from a costuming perspective, we always think of dress. Um, but it was large wall cloths, for instance, or bedspreads um, that, that you see in the beginnings and you see descriptions of room completely decorated in chins, which there are some in dollhouses that still exist. I don't know of that many real life ones, but it must have been stunning yeah. um, the way that looked. And the interesting thing is that because it was so popular, a lot of countries were a little bit scared of their own fabric industries mm. so in england and in france in particular uh, they had bans at some point on printed cotton so you couldn't wear trade sell or make printed cottons mm. um, and they had slightly different rules so for instance i believe in england you could um print uh, fustian i think it's called so this yes. linen cotton mix because yes. <laughs> then there was linen in it and then it yeah, was the more industrial not quite so aesthetic Cotton. yeah yeah um but i think this is one of the reasons also why the dutch have a fairly prominent history with chins of course mm -hmm. because they were the traders but also because it was never banned in the yes. Netherlands. of course as soon as something becomes popular an expensive luxury product becomes popular what do you do you try to make an imitation that's cheaper yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um that's exactly what happened here and people started comp printing factories um yeah. all over so, no. And for a very long time, they existed simultaneously, but people people were very, very good at seeing the quality of fabric in those days. Yeah, that was so important um, that 
you know, people bought it, but it was sort of the cheaper substitute. And I think even now we can we can see the difference. Often oh yeah, we see the difference. Yeah. Another reason, which I think is good to mention, that they try to copy it's money, but it's mm. also time. If yeah. you send an order to India, it takes two years to get <laughs> to get that right back. Um, these these journeys were very long. The process of making it was long, and the journey back was very long. And tastes changed. Yeah. So to be really to be able to react to changing fashions. Yeah. That that was one of the other reasons that people wanted to produce more locally. Mm. Um, so it was not not just the money; it was also that aspect, um, which yeah, it, it it took a long time to get to India by boat <laughs> from uh, from Europe, <laughs> um, and it was a hazardous journey. So yeah, you would put in an order, and you'd have to wait two years for it to get back. Mm -hmm. Gin sort of be started to become popular at the end of seventeenth century. The popularity just just kept rising, really. Mm. And between 1750 and 1770 is also the bans in France and England were lifted. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I think now when we think of chins in, in dress and in existing pieces, it's mostly that latter half of the 18th century that yes. we think about. About 1750s to 1790s. Yeah. Um, that's really when it was at its height um, in popularity and, and in how much people owned and how much it was worn. There was also sort of the time when the printing factories in, in Europe started to, to start achieving <laughs> uh, more, more high quality products. Yeah. But again, this, this had been going on for 200 years at this point, right? Um, and one thing that's good to note is that the European print of cotton was almost exclusively block printed. Yes. There wasn't really any hand painting being done. Um, so even though you also had some block printing in India, it was mostly hand painting, whereas in Europe it was much more industrial, right? If you, if you block print, you print everything the same in one go. So yes. the more shades you want, the more production it entails. Whereas, yes. for instance, with the mordants and the reds, I do believe they could just add different layers or, or have it a little thicker and a little thinner. All oh, right, okay. It, it's probably a little, a little bit different with the indigo, I don't know for sure, but because there was a dye bath, it would be more similar to having another round of printing. Mm. You do also get the more two-tone or two-color things from India, mm. but I think it was also taste. So I know that a lot of the two-tone fabrics, which we now see in the Netherlands, also sort of are known to have been made for specific markets. Okay. Um, so for instance, for mourning, people would, in, in a lot of places, would not wear red, so then it would need to be blues only. Right. Um, and then it could be made in India just on those requests. <laughs> True. So I think probably price and the fact that production was more expensive if you wanted more, more colors and more shades played a part in it, but I think it was also just taste. Okay. Um, and this European taste that was also inspired by what people knew of the East, which mm. was then influenced by, by China um, and by pottery, which was blue and white. <laughs> yes, true. And th that was so popular at the time that that probably also influenced to some extent what, what people's aesthetic tastes were. Yes, these things are all connected, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not a, a thing you can really only look at in isolation as a fabric. It's, oh, it's no. decorative it's arts. It's the right. material culture that, uh, that, that society was surrounded by, not just what was on their bodies, but what was on their tables and on their walls, the, yeah. the aesthetic and what they wanted and what, the, you know, down to colors. And yes, yeah. that it all... And, and nowadays we, we see fabric so much as something that you wear, but like I said, the wall hangings and the bed hangings. And of course. It, this, this predates wallpaper. So yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> fabric is something you, you decorate your house with much more then than it is now as well yes um, so those lines are a little bit blurrier so do the taste changed uh -huh. around 1800 that's of course something you see in the silhouette yes. and the cut of their dresses there's a drastic move from the old to the new yes um and and the chin's popularity didn't really survive that so you see yeah. a lot of chin's gowns in the early 19th century mm -hmm. from older fabrics Mm -hmm. because people they keep reusing it and the fabric itself was very sturdy and pretty and kept yes. well yes. so it would have been recut and reused but for less fashionable things yes um 
and then there was really this shift also towards the white and the sheer fabrics and yes. and when that changed again jeans never really came back the way it did because the whole cotton industry had changed so tremendously yes. in the netherlands it never really went away no. um so our our traditional or regional costumes you should almost call it they were specific things that were worn in specific regions mm. around towns or 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 larger regions and nowadays days we tend to think of folk costume as this sort of national or nas feeling of nationality but it's really much more about region and community um, in those days and in the 18th century you already have some places that have specific types of headdress or mm -hmm. slightly different ways of styling things mm -hmm. um, and those communities were also the slowest to pick up on this drastic new silhouette so you get these pictures from 1800 in people in full hoops yeah <laughs> and you think is this misdated but yeah. it, it, it's really not that this is just the, the dutch protestant you know they don't really trust change or the french <laughs> right um so they're slow they're slow to change but this appreciation for good fabric really mm -hmm. stayed and because people were less influenced by by these fashion crazes chins also stayed popular in a lot of ways in in, in different places in, in small things so people kept wearing these old petticoats mm -hmm. um, for a long time even though it, it you know the trade to india wasn't really there anymore um so that did decline and change at some point but this this love for this fabric never really went away um and especially in the north in in friesland the town of hindelope is, is mm. the one example that everyone knows of because they had these long coats of chins um and it so became nice. almost this national symbol yeah chins. um and that costume actually disappeared in the 1880s. The, the last person wearing this daily died in the late 19th century. But there were a lot of folk groups which kept this, this costume alive. And I think that's also why when Dutch people see it, they think of Dutch traditional costume and they think, right. think of folk costume. So I think that's also why there's a lot of information available in Dutch about chins. True. Right? Oh, <laughs> yes. And, um, and, and incredible collections that are in museums that yes. the Netherlands have. Because people valued it as this part yeah. of material culture and because it yeah. had this sort of almost nationalistic, national pride type of feeling. And especially Finland has its own language and its own culture and is very proud of that. Right. So as a badge of, of that identity, yes. people kept it. Yes. And therefore, it it stayed popular even though it was never as prized as a fabric as the, the most luxurious silk brocade was yeah that was also still a step beyond that um but chins was treasured for for also for that that reason in the land so we have a very large um collection in different museums um here in the islands in different places Yes, I've seen just a few, and it's just wet my appetite to see more. Yeah, it's uh, and I know there's a lot I haven't seen still. I've I've been to about every exhibition for the last four four or five years when they've had something. Yes, yeah. Um, but I know there's more, and there's a lot of local small museums as well. Yes, which is are very scattered. There are permanent collections in, in much smaller scale. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but you need to know where to look. Some yes. Some <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we've talked a little bit about how it was used on decor, and of course we know from extants that it was used in clothing, but how how was it worn? What sorts of garments and who was wearing it and what sort of styles? And you know, let's as costumers, <laughs> let's get going with what we can do realistically and with some historical basis um, in our costuming today. Yeah. So I think we, we know very little about the chins that really came early so before yeah. you know before the, the the 1650s we know very little about how it was used but it's probably at that point it was mostly home home decor type of things okay um so so really the wall hangings and the bed spreads which you do see a lot in collections today but as of course as costumers we're not as focused on sheets of fabric <laughs> i know <laughs> i don't, was, like, I don't nice think it. So would it have been decor, home decor, that was driving all of that incredible levels of trade? 
Yeah, I think that's really how it started off. That's how it started, okay. Um, because people had their way of, of dressing and that didn't suddenly mm. drastically change with the dress and okay. fabric. It trickled into the homes of, of the upper class, mm. of course, because that, that, this, these were very expensive foreign goods. They, they didn't just yes. appear on the market for everyone to buy, of course. Yes. So it's home deck were in these stately big homes and, and mm. those were the people who would have seen it and come to know it. That in most places, that's the, the, the upper classes, like the upper echelons of society, were also the ones that started wearing it as well. Okay. Um, but of course, they were used to the silk brocades, and, and chins never really got to that status point. It was very pretty, yeah. and um, because it was glazed at the time and it had this shine, it did right. have this sort of almost likeness to silk, but people were very good at identifying fabrics, then no one would have mistaken it for a silk. Mm. So it started really in undress. Yeah, okay. The things you wear in your home, in the comfortable clothes. Um, and of course, in the 18th century, that was a little bit different than we think of it now, because nowadays you wouldn't receive your guests in your undress. And that was a thing then, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so it started in these lounge garments. Right. Um, and that's something we still see a lot of today because in men's clothing, it almost stayed there. It, it, it did move on a little mm. bit, but in, in men's clothing, you see these dressing gowns, these, um, in Dutch, we call them Japonse Rokken. Yes. Really as a reference to Japanese cut and style, it was very much inspired by the kimonos, but then the fabric was Indian. <laughs> yes. Um, and it was the same in England. There's rash of fashionable people being... Uh, having their portraits painted yeah. in this undress style, but then their perception of what of division between public life and private life was different from yeah. today. So that was that was what they did. So so Chintz was was in that world as well. Yeah, that's why it was started undress. With really. Started with undress um, as as undress for the rich. Yeah, because of course full dress for the rich never really became Chintz that much. It, right. it trickles up up into it every now and then. Yeah. Um, but for for the very for really the yeah, aristocracy chins was never as high quality as the highest quality silk they could get. Of course, of course. Um, but then it sort of starts to trickle down as as things are wont to do. Yeah. Um, and it mainly in women's garments it really rises to to full popularity and mm. you see it in basically everything mm. but the very very richest would have probably worn it more as undress whereas more middle class people would have worn the best stuff for for you know going to church it's on sunday and the fashion. poorest couldn't afford it right. um it was it was cotton but it was still a high quality expensive fabric in yes that sense. so you see it in quite a while in children's clothing the first picture that I know of is a painting of a family in the late 17th century. Mm -hmm. And the girl, so the parents are both wearing black. Mm -hmm. um, very, very Dutch thing to do at the time. Mm -hmm. um, because black fabrics were expensive. But the girl is actually dressed in what look, really looks like printed cotton. Right. So that painting is one of the first depictions that we, we really have of chins. Yes. And you see also in, in current collections that there's a lot of children's clothing in chins, a lot of babies clothing as well. Um, a part of that might be that you can cut up stuff to make it smaller. So if you have a prized fabric, then it's quite likely that at some point it will end up in you know, a baby's outfit, especially yes, if it's possible. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and Probably it trickles down from these upper classes to, to say, more the servant class, which in a way, style-wise, was almost a bit in between the lower classes because they would inherit clothing from, mm. from mm. that they served with. It, it became more popular in the lower classes as you go mm -hmm. on in time. When you look at what exists now in terms of, of chins in museums and the different mm. types of garments that, mm. that have survived, Mm -hmm. looking at like what what still exists and what do we have because it shows a little bit about um what type of garments chins could be made of another good way is to look at, at inventory lists mm -hmm. um so to look at what people 
when people pass away, there were usually formal lists drawn up of, of all their property and all their goods to, to what would go to whom. And those lists we still have. Yes. And the nice thing of that is that we know they show a fairly complete picture. Terminology is always a bit difficult um, because what do they call what? <laughs> The story with extents is, of course, what was valuable as much as what existed. Mm. Uh, and that you get a little bit less with inventory lists. Looking at that, you see that indeed it's mostly women's wear. Mm. So for, for men, it's mostly it, it's the bunions, it's, it's the, the dressing gowns sure. predominantly. And then for the lower classes, you do see some, some garments. Um, like, like waistcoats, for instance, okay. made of chins, in the Netherlands specifically. I know that probably existed more also in the regions where chins was more worn as, as type mm -hmm. of or regional type of costume, right? In women's dress, it, it, you see almost all types of garments <clears throat> made out of chins. Um, outer garments, right? Because, you know, just the linens, not obviously. Oh, yeah. sure. um, you do see a lot more jackets and petticoats yes. than gowns. Yes. Now, with that comes the know that people in generally Dutch costume, there were a lot of regions in which people mostly wore petticoats and jackets, much more than mm. gowns anyway. And that was really this sort of stick to the old Protestant, we don't trust the French <laughs> type of attitude, which um, if wearing fancy gowns, that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> no, but you do want to be dressed better than the person sitting next to you in church. This is, oh, of course. <laughs> it's this very interesting. We don't want to be fancy Catholics as the French are, but we do want to be the best dressed in town. Right, yes. <laughs> so there's this very subtle, um, I think, I think that's trying human nature. <laughs> <I think. Yeah. laughs> I love this story, this because it's so recognizable, right? Yes. <laughs> to us now. <laughs> but one of the things is that gowns were, were I think, in general, like a bit less worn than, than in other places. Yeah. Um, but looking at accents, you also do see less gowns. Yes. Then again, you have, there, there's a couple of sack gowns which are made out of chins, which are beautiful. So yeah. the one that you are work, going to work on, yes. um, I think, is one of the prettiest examples. And it's um, it's a it's a it's a bit of a mystery because that one the provenance is apparently French. It's the only one I know of in the Dutch style chins. I know of a few in in what the British were doing to compete. The British competing yeah uh, floral cottons. There there yeah. are lots of those. There are lots more yeah. of those. Yeah. So the red ground that was that was really a thing that was yes. known to be sort of a Dutch thing Very almost. Dutch and thing. you see a lot more um, chins in in Dutch collections with. Oh, different yeah. color grounds. Yeah. Um, you have the white grounds as well, but you see a lot more of the colors. There's yeah. some blue and some green, which is yeah. a bit rarer even than, yeah. than the red, but, but really, really beautiful. But I, I personally really love the red ground. I'm a sucker um, for red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. But it, yeah. And what I also find interesting about your, your, your example is that it was, it's dated during the French bands, right? So Yes, Even though there were bands on wearing this stuff, people were still doing it. In the Netherlands, I know of one sack gown that's in the next museum, that one that does have a white ground. And yes. it's for a sack, it's, it's simple. It yeah. has barely any decoration. It doesn't have very wide hoops. Um, so and I would say that- It's isn't it? It's 1780s? It, it could be, yeah, it's probably quite later. Very, very narrow um, yeah. uh, pleats in the back. Yes. Yeah. And quite low in the front. Uh, Especially it's very low in the front, um, but a lot yeah, of no, a lot of Dutch jackets are very very low. Yes, they wouldn't have been worn without anything underneath. No, though. absolutely. <laughs> um, so I do wonder about that one because it's the only one I know of that example. But you have a lot of jackets that are cut extremely low, but that's because people would wear a type of partlet underneath the partlet always. Under yes, and then and the English kerchief. weren't wearing the partlets; they were wearing kerchiefs yeah. and other types of things. But the partlet carried on and. The Netherlands. Yeah, so You're that's a very Dutch thing. But people yeah. also work with chiefs, so you you don't yes, spot these partlets in paintings at all. You don't true. see them, but we have a lot of excellent ones, and you do get the the fitted back gowns um, yeah. in chintzes as well. There's a couple of beautiful examples in Dutch collections as well. One of one of my favorites is uh, the one with the red ground in, in the Rotterdam Museum. That's a very it's the style and the cut in itself is very Dutch, and then the chintz is very Dutch, and it's 
Yes. It's a lovely example. Um, but jackets really predominantly were made out of chintz. Um, and as we all know the one in the Rijksmuseum that is pattern matched in that fan shape on the back. It's yeah. just, just one of the most glorious examples. That's one, of yeah. It's, yeah. It's just extraordinary. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that one is that it's actually Hindelope specific. So is it really? From, yeah, it is. <laughs> Why you can barely see that from the back. So that No, no. Um, no but it, Hindelope as a town, because they had these long, almost coat-like yes, garments like, without mm -hmm. a waist seam, yes. you have a short version of that, which is open uh, in the front. Uh, it, it just runs down and it, it has this, this sort of tape-like yes. thing. Um, so it's called a Cossacaintje which is probably from the French Cossacan, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the Dutch way. Yeah. Um, and it's cut in the same way as the long, oh, the, I long see. Down, I... the long went case, except it's just cut short. I've seen it in person. And what I really, really loved is that there's this little bit at the bottom, which is completely not symmetrical at all. But because it's cut so photos. well in other places, <laughs> you don't even see that. But no. it sort of makes them, it makes them human. Human. Right? Yeah, and of course, in, in Hindelope, it was worn in, in these jackets. But I always say okay. that pe people love that so much, but you need to see it in context. In context. I, I mean, you, you can always recreate whatever you want, of course. But if you think about how it was worn, this was worn mm. with a sp very specific type of other garments, a mm. specific fabric type of apron, a specific um, type of headdress. And, yes. Um, it really belongs together with all these other elements. Yes. Um, to make up this this wonderful colorful costume yeah. that we still love today. The thing also with, with that Dutch culture is that you know there there's no oppression there. So mm. um, I think anything you see in Dutch tra traditional costume and and you love, feel free to be inspired by it. And yeah. especially the Ventke. Um It is always we'll just I think it's always Ventke nice if people the name of that style. Yeah. yeah. So the long coat is called a Wendke. Yeah. 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 Um, and the short one, uh, Kasakain. But I think it's it's always good if you see some something which really belongs to this very specific context to even look at pictures because I, I know how hard it can be to find information mm -hmm. that is not in Dutch. Yes. <laughs> right? Um, or your Frisian, which I can read. And I know in Hindelo, but they have their own dialect again. Yes. Which definitely this is true. <laughs> this is true. Um, but to be aware of mm. that, right? Mm. That, that will be enough to say, yeah, I, I've, I've seen it. I know there, there's a lot more to it. Um, and I, 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 I'm inspired by what it is now. I want to see yes. what I can do with that. I'll yes. take over it. I'd love to yes. see that. Yes. Um, I, I know that a lot of times we insp get inspired by garments we see in museums and we take that garment, that idea, and then import it into another impression and then there's also the temptation sometimes when asking for advice for people to think oh that's a very dutch thing well yes yes and you have some people then saying you can't wear that unless you're doing a dutch impression or or you've got dutch ancestry or some sort of backstory that adds context and that, well that's not necessarily true it is still i it's an eye opener to appreciate that that jacket was part of an overall costume, an overall style of dress that was not just about the jacket. Yeah, I mean, it's Hindelope is known for chintz, but if you look yes. at portraits also from, from the 19th century mostly, yeah. um, but even before, they wore silk brocades as well. It's just, it's you know. The style. <laughs> they're, they're sort of famous for this very distinctive style that they had. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the thing is, I'm not from Friesland. I don't speak the language, no. right? Um, I go and visit my uncles every once in a while because they and they live close to Hindelope. So, so I, I've been there and, and I love the town, but it's also in that sense, yes, I'm Dutch, but what does it really mean to have that as your, as your heritage, right? Yes, it's, yes. Um, also the costume groups that, that still do, that are from there and that, that really still wear this dress on special occasions. If you're genuinely interested, that's what they love, right? Because yeah. they, they, they have this passion for it themselves. Yes. Um, it is about sharing the love, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and sort of respecting that there's, there's a context to it. And then um, um, you don't necessarily need to completely take over that context. 
So we have we have ventured into the the, uh, the yeah. question: How do you wear this? How do you style? Yeah. It? And this, of course, raises the perennial question about mixing patterns. What sort of um, evidence do we have or not as to yeah. mixing different colors and motifs in exactly. different garments? Wearing a loud and proud jacket with a petticoat that is of a completely different design. I mean, yeah. is, there any, is there any foundation for that? Not, not that much. The thing is, a lot of people, they, they see these beautiful fabrics and mm -hmm. some, somehow the Dutch have become sort of known for mixing, mixing yeah. different prints and different things. And I think absolutely there were different mixing motifs and different fabrics that nowadays we maybe wouldn't think of. So a chintz jacket would be worn with, for instance, a silk brocade um, or a silk damask skirt. Uh, the mask was very popular. So the two-toned uh -huh. okay. uh, motifs and then well, with yeah. a checkered, actually also Indian cotton. Yes. So in that sense, you get a lot of mixing of colors and, and patterns. I've looked into how much actually people would wear one chintz jacket with a different chintz petticoat. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to find solid evidence that that was done. People mm -hmm. owned both. But when you look at most pictures, mm -hmm. it seems to be more likely that you would wear your chintz jacket with, say, a silk damask, um, okay. for sure, or a bit for a wool damask, which they okay. also made, um, one of my, my other fav favorite fabrics. Or that if they wore a chintz petticoat, they were most likely under petticoats, a lot of them. Right. Because, of course, if you lift your skirts a little, you see the edge, and then um, you want that to be pretty. Yes. So, but to, to wear them together, um, I found one doll which has a chintz, a dark brown chintz jacket and a lighter mm -hmm. skirt. Mm -hmm. But with dolls, you never really know whether they're dressed exactly the same as they were in the days. Yes. And there, there's this series of pictures that everyone always shows us as the, the printing, mixing, matching yeah. thing. And they're, they're lovely images, um, but they're sort of watercolor sketch mm. so it's really really difficult to say whether something is a silk brocade or whether something is a is a printed cotton so i'm a little bit hesitant about it i, I at some point i asked one of the curators um, of the large chintz exhibition in the Vries museum a couple of years ago she has written multiple books about chintz and in that exhibition they had a lot of beautiful examples with a jacket and a match and a petticoat in different chances mm -hmm. um, and I asked her how likely do you think it is um, and she said well it's, it's really hard to know for sure mm -hmm. we know we have a lot of jackets we know we have at least a fair number of petticoats which were mm -hmm. probably worn to be worn to be seen on top yeah, seen, yeah. Um, but probably it wasn't that like that common to always wear mm -hmm. wear them together if they didn't match so they wouldn't uh, be considered a matching set. Yeah, they probably people would, would wear. They have very, very little matching sets of jackets. Yes. So yeah. they, they existed. We know that, yeah. but they're also probably people could put splurge on a jacket then, and then maybe on a petticoat next. And mm -hmm. a lot of petticoats were fabric was specifically printed for a petticoat because they have these yes, large borders. Yes, this is true. This is true. It's really hard to make a jacket out of it then. <laughs> yes. Well, like embroidered silk panels that were obviously embroidered to order for particular yeah. types of garments so that the you get pattern that would fall in certain places. And it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that yeah. we see chintz. There's well. a couple of banyans which you can mm. see that the pockets are spared out in chintz. Mm, right, so, so that was not just done with embroidery, but it no. was done with, with cottons as well. Wow. Um, so it's, it's probably not as likely as we would sometimes like to believe just because it's so much fun. Yes. <laughs> right? um, but people did own all of it at the same time. So yes. they would have coexisted in the world. They wouldn't have looked at you weirdly if you showed up in church with a jacket and a petticoat matched. Um, it's just more probable that you would then have chosen a damask. It's a little, little bit quieter, um, and that then it allows your jacket to shine, or or the other way around. And and then of course, aside from these main garments, you had a lot of more accessory type of garments, and those are very much okay. what, often made in chintz, also because it's a good way to sort of really liven up something s smaller. True. Yes, it's true. So there's a lot of sun hats um, that have beautiful linings. 
Yes. Um, and they and were especially the one in, in Friesland. Yeah, they, they had these very big to the front going lace caps. Uh, yes. with very much stiffened, but also with eye wires in it. So yes. these these sun hats have a very odd shape that makes sense only if you see only when you put them on. They go towards yes. the front <laughs> only. <laughs> um but they often have very beautiful chintz linings, which we can sort of show through, of yeah. course, the, the lace of the cap. Yeah. Um, but also what we'd call powder cloaks in Dutch, um, mm. which are these little undress capes almost. Oh, okay. Or, for instance, if you were powdering your hair and um, oh, it could be washed. Yeah. Okay. You, you wear that to protect your, your clothing. Right. Mm. And there's, they made those in chintz? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, as well. So, so there's a couple of those. There's actually in the Fies Museum, they have a combination of a jacket, almost empire style. So that was probably um, an older fabric that was recut right. to, to a newer sure. style, a sun hat and a cape, all in the same fabric. And oh. I don't think they necessarily came from the same collection. And this was apparently uh, a popular fabric. <laughs> yeah, that was around um, yeah. and, and used for all of these different things. And and some aprons even, although it's more probable that, that aprons were made of the checkered cotton and then you get a little strip of jeans right. here and there. So so it's, it's very diverse. So this feels yeah. quite boring now. Can, you know <laughs> <laughs> so many options, so many options. Yeah. Anyone with an interest in Dutch chins of the period, all sorts of different things. Yeah. To look for in images and yeah, really look, look, look at images. And and what I find really difficult is that the people who owned the most chins were also always the most rich. They, mm. they also had the most clothing, but they weren't necessarily all, any portrayed in chins. Because for them, it wasn't of their course. most classy fabric. Of course. You they need to look for chins in more of the unknown portraits. And that's, you know, the ones hanging in houses that don't have online collections. Or, but they're much harder to find. Oh, yes. There, there's one in the, I believe it's in the Schreepark Museum in Snake. So it's in Friesland. Um, of a girl wearing a dark blue chintz jacket, oh. just beautiful. And then there's also the sort of the time aspect to think of that people reuse chintz for quite a long while, but depending on what type of gown you're making, if you're making a more upper class gown, then you probably are more likely to want a type of, of chintz and sort of a style that was more popular at the time. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're making a jacket, you can be a bit more old fashioned because it could have been reused or recut. Sure longer and very very generally speaking even in the Netherlands you see that the, the earlier you go the bigger the motifs are as it was with silks yeah 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 I followed that trend and some of the printed cottons near the end are, are almost they feel more more European to mm. us so that's a generalization but it, it's sort of one thing you can keep in mind so if you have this very very big print and a very dainty print yeah then they'd be less likely to be worn together because they're not sort of fashionable at the same uh, time. <laughs> and then you might have them both at the same time. Yeah. And then one would be your good fashionable one. And one <laughs> would be your sort of unfashionable, but I want to look some... Serviceable. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. What about local tastes? Or We've talked a bit about backgrounds, how the Dutch really seem to love the dark, the, some of the coloured grounds, the red yeah. grounds and the blue grounds and the, the odd rare green ground. And what we tend to see with printed cottons, whether they were produced in India with the chintz methods or not, and the British seem to have a lot more pale or white or unbleached. Um, mm -hmm. was, is that something to do with the process or has that really come down to different fashions, do you think? I think it really comes down to taste. taste. Because they were buying from the same people, largely. So um, it was the customer-driven di demand. I, I think way. it was really that, yeah. yeah. And, and the, Indian, the Indians were very good at that, That's of true. knowing what was popular. Um, so I don't, I, I can't really explain where this penchant for red comes from. Um, because if you look at the the 17th century Dutch fashionable dress, it's all black. It's all black. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe it's a counter reaction, but... Um, <laughs> The Dutch all woke up one morning and said, if we demand red. <laughs> all yeah. Red. <laughs> I subscribe I to that. I don't know. Um, maybe also, I don't know if it was more expensive. It might have been. Or maybe it might also be... just the market. Yeah. Just it might also be time-related because 
yeah, the, the Dutch were getting used to chins already at the, the beginning of, of the 18th century. It was really, yes. really big. Yes. Whereas for English, it sort of started only after also the, the style slightly changes from this Baroque to more Rococo type mm. of ornamentation. Mm. That might also have something to do with it, that mm. the Dutch were already more familiar with this, this red ground and sort of, they sort of kept it being sort of the old fashioned. Which at the end of the 18th century, the East India Trading Company was not what it had been. And the Dutch Republic, in that sense, was also politically and, and economically not nearly as strong as it had been 100 years ago. The, they were becoming a little backwards in the sense that where the French and, and the English were much more looking towards the future. Expansion. So that might have something to do with it as well, that the Dutch clung to old styles, whereas for the English, it only really started the big hype started a bit later because of the bands that were lifted only afterwards. Mm. And, but that's that's speculation. It could yeah, well, just yeah. be taste and what you're used to. And again, it's these nuances that we don't know how much influence these different aspects had. The 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 17th century when I grew up, it was always called the golden age. Uh, For a very long time, it, it has that name in, in the Netherlands because it was is? yeah the Gouden Eeuw. So it's it's the age in which you get the classical painters, Rembrandt, right? The, the that spike. You get these in your trading company. It's the age in which the Republic was founded. So the Netherlands officially became its own country, and it's really only now that people are starting to sort of change that name because mm -hmm. it was also the age of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Let's face it; it was good for a number of rich people, but it drove the economy. Yeah, yeah, um, but not for everyone. Mm. But that age that has a very strong resonance in sort of the public consciousness of the Netherlands as, as the age of you know when we actually mattered as, as a tiny country <laughs> um so it so could very well british, be that, that the, the british 18th have century empire <laughs> the, the british have this yes yes every modern country seems to look back with rose-colored glasses at these periods when they felt that they were at the top of their game or something yeah yeah the, yeah Another thing is that sometimes sort of old clothing traditions sort of were translated to chins, and that's what you, mm. you see with mourning, for instance. Mm. And in Hindelope, I think you can see that very clearly because it's this, this small town and, and sort of there, there's more chins that we still know of. But you get this very, very dark, almost it's a brown black ground with only white bearings, yes. and that's really heavy mourning. Yes. Um, which was probably made specifically for that. And then the lighter blue-white was probably also specifically made. And then for weddings, they had the white ground with the red. Red. Gorgeous. Yeah. Which they called blood and milk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a very... I, I, I love that name. It's, it's so visceral in a way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> these markets had these demands for specific colors and certain color combinations. Mm. Right? Um, and the meaning that, that ties and in. And the meaning that people... Yeah sort of ascribed to it. Um, and in a lot of traditional costume, even today, blue and white is light mourning. Mm. Purple and, and right that, that and that still sort of resonates it for does. me. You get it in, in regular dress in the 19th century as well, of course, but mm. that already existed in, in the 18th century mm. in a large way. Mm. And chins was just adapted to fit that style. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so that feeds into, I know one of the books that we were talking about that's in Dutch that is about how chintz sort of changed Dutch life, but the Dutch took yeah. chintz to their hearts, to their homes, to their bodies in a way that they've never, you've never really let go of, where in other countries it definitely had its peak and then gave way to other fashions. And these where the Dutch have really adopted it and made it your own. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you see that in words as well. So we started with this terminology thing, and, and mm. I, I took it really back to, to how it was made, but just how the word chins is used in English, it's also just to mean a busy floral pattern. Yes. Whereas the Dutch translation, um, seats, so it, it's, in, in sound it's very close, it has the same roots, but seats just means this 18th century fabric. Just. It's not used for any type of floral. Right. It's only used for this type of cotton. Coming to the present, right? Mm -hmm. um, the town of Münzgrote and Spakenburg mm -hmm. is a town where there are, there are still a, a fairly 
large population of women who still wear the traditional dress. Mm -hmm. And sort of the eye-catching piece is really what came from this part loop we, we talked about before, yes, except it's now this wide. Exaggerated. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's very, very stiff and it sort of folds over. Mm. Um, and it's just grown in size like fashion fads do. Because of the fabrics were still prized, they, they actually went looking for original 18th century fabrics to turn into these, the coplop, as they call it. Yes. Um, and it's a little bit of a mixed story because it often meant cutting up old petticoats to make something new. And for now, us, the idea of cutting up an 18th century chintz petticoat is slightly horrifying. <laughs> and what helps me is that this is not a one-time project to no. it's not even a one-time art project no. it's something that's extremely treasured in this society they have a lot of these and, and most of them are made from more modern cottons and, okay. and princes and people in that town know who has the old 18th century <laughs> one and who knows who has the pretty one lying in their closet only for special days right it's it's this highly prized thing that's so appreciated still yes that um that almost makes up for it. They they have gotten, I think over the last 10, 10 years, they have gotten a bit more um, uh, careful in, in cutting up old pieces. Aware of what they have, yeah. More aware <laughs> of, of the value that it has before they do that. The, the people in the museums are good to talk to because yeah. we, you have to remember that these are clothes. Yeah. People. They're not dressed up for tourists, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so they're clothes. And if you, if you want a picture, ask nicely. Be mm -hmm. okay if they say no then they don't mind, most of them. Yeah. Just don't take snapshot of them while they're walking down the street because they're really just wearing what they've literally worn yeah. all their life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, that's but the people in the museums yeah. are good to talk to about it if they have some English. And that's, it's the older generation who still wear it. The language, I, I, I definitely do see if it could be a barrier, but most of them, if you're genuinely interested, are, are quite happy to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's a special thing that these old fabrics are still treasured there and worn. Oh yeah, which is such a rare okay. thing. Yeah, um, and it will disappear yeah. in a couple of decades. Yeah, and and a certain richness to life will be lost when it goes. Yeah, yes, it's uh, it's very double sided because I can't blame anyone for changing out of something that's so mm. regional, so specific. There's women who never dress otherwise, but if they go on holiday, they take dresses because mm. quite frankly, they don't want to explain to everyone that they're not a part of a, of a dancing group, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm a part of a dancing group and I've been abroad in traditional costumes, so I, I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you get the attention, but it, you will lose something. Yeah. And things become costume exactly. instead of clothing. For the modern 21st century yes. costume. <laughs> Looking for chintz, you and I both have our favorites, but let's toss some of them out there. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's good also to to go back to this definition, right? So yeah, definition. Can you still get fabrics that are made this way? Yes. Um, to some extent in India, yes. Mm. <laughs> They'll probably be block printed instead of hand painted, but they won't look like the European 18th century chintzes because they'll have completely different motives. But there are still craftsmen in India using natural dyes, yes. using the resist and, and, and the, and the mordant based methods to make fabrics. Mm -hmm. um, for that, you really need to be in India. Um, and I don't know specific sources, um, but, but it does exist. But it doesn't look like what we as historical customers are looking for, which is something that looks like a thing. Yes. Um, now there's one artist, um, her name is Renuka Reddy, if I'm pronouncing it right, but she's an Indian artist who specializes in hand painting fabrics mm. um, in the 18th century European mm -hmm. style using traditional methods. She's made some things for museums, right? Um, I think you can commission her, I have no clue what she costs, but I wanted to mention her because she's the only one that I know of who really makes chins following the full spectrum of meanings. She would be the epitome. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So and for, I, mere, for mere mortals, like Yeah, me. exactly. <laughs> I, I wanted to start with there because the rest of our sources are all 
you know, or um, either American or European. In the Netherlands, there's there's two main lines of fabric which are really meant as reproductions mm -hmm. of jeans. The one which I believe is is the one you're wearing right now is, is DutchFabrics.com. It's um, actually no, this is the other one. So so Dutch Fabrics very specifically makes reproduction jeans. They do copper plate printing. They have a factory in the Netherlands, and they glaze their fabrics. And, and that's for me, what that's I'm that's my the key. Gown. My sat gown is is that is yes. their fabric. So for me, the the original chins, the 18th century garments I have seen were all glazed yeah. to some extent. Some of them to the point where you think, is is that the plastic layer covering it? It's shiny. <laughs> they don't coat for their glazing. It's really a heat and pressure process, yeah. um, which is called calandering. Now I believe that in the period they might have used some sort of dry starch to further the effect. For me, that, that's such an integral part to what chins look like, which is really hard to see in photos. If you've only ever seen chins in pictures online, you're not there's no fault that you don't spot that because it's really, really hard to see unless you're there in person, you move and you see the shift mm. in the light. Mm. But it's something that's very characteristic to me. And, and that's why I love their reproductions because they're the only one that I know of that actually plays their fabric. No. Of, of fabrics, right? They're a very small Dutch based factory. Um, but I think, you know, in, in sort of production terms, if you don't want to go see the effort of hand painted stuff, um, I think they're the closest you can get. The other line is quilting cottons that are really specifically made with reproduction prints. The difference is that they're quilting cottons. So the, yeah. the weight and the hand is different. Um, and they're not glazed. They're a little looser. In weave yes um and actually this indian artist she wrote an article for one of the books it's, it's right there on my bookshelf um <laughs> about how much it matters that you have a very very high quality cotton because you need fine well fine threads but also very finely woven for it to not run yes to be really a smooth almost paper-like surface yes um so to get closer to that you want this really really high quality fabric and quilting cottons is a little bit more um, supple, mm -hmm. usually, and a little bit thicker, I think. I've never handed, like, like physically touched <laughs> the, the 18th century stuff, but... Yeah. Well, um, I have, this is, this is the, um, the Dutch, dutchquilts.com, yeah. and yeah. then the dutchfabric.nl, I have both. Yeah. They are a similar weight, but the glazed, um, the hand is different. Uh, I believe that the Dutch fabric uh, range is is more tightly woven. This is, is the Dutch heritage yeah. range, which is readily available in the UK. They're both a pleasure to hand sew. Yeah, absolutely. But their characteristics handling is very, very different. But this is incredibly soft, the quilting. Yeah. So that's with the glazing, you lose a bit of that soft. You do touch. lose a little bit of that softness. Right. But then on the other yeah. hand, you get the drape and hang with the 18th century styles that do involve a lot of yardage, a lot of fabric. Yeah. It doesn't hang limply. It really has a fantastic sort of structure in a way. Yeah. yeah it yeah. just looks right. I think that for a jacket, yeah. um, you can get away more easily with the softer fabric mm. because Mm. more of it is close to your body anyway mm. yes and because it's all close fitted and worn over stage you get that structure anyway yes whereas for a sack gown um you you have you need more of that structure in the way it falls do yeah. well and to, to be fair the, the the dutch fabric line they also they take a yes, motif they but they do make different versions in different yes. colors than the original right? so you could always ask them like which which color combination was the original and they know a lot about the fabric so their color combinations are always plausible yes but they're not always direct reproductions of color wise of an ex exactly. existing fabric so williamsburg i believe carries also reproduction prints from what they have in their collection those are very much an anglo interpretation very okay. yeah so that there will be sort of reproductions of the cottons that were printed yeah. for that market but not and in many the, of yeah. them, and many of them based on home decor fashions in colors that weren't typically worn for clothing, but would have been used for home decor. And I think when it comes to easy access, IKEA is still one of the things 
to, to name out because they do base a lot of their fabric on 18th century prints. The difficulty is that some of them, they change more than others. They never tell you which ones that is. You know, we can name what's out there now, but there's always a good um, community to sort of say, okay, which, which is more likely. It's really, really hard to judge whether something looks authentic. And it's really difficult to put your finger on what exactly it is that makes something look authentic or not. Mm. Um, so you often see a need there, the, there's too much green comment, which I get because you don't often see a lot of different shades of green ranging from yellow to, to dark and, and everything in between. Yeah. That's not something you see a lot of. But you do have green ground chintz, so it's not like you don't have chintz with a lot of green in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there are a lot of nuances here that get lost, I think, when trying to help people who are new to costumes yeah. through this period, is that you want to give them guidelines that they can rely on, that they can go ahead and make decisions based on and know they're not being sort of led astray. Yeah. But a lot of the nuances do get lost. Yeah. And, and a lot of the context too, because mm -hmm. sometimes teasing out what would be appropriate for what someone might have in mind involves asking a lot more questions that sometimes, yeah. they, haven't thought, sometimes they haven't just made those decisions yet and they don't realize that that it even matters. That it even matters. That it, that it, that it yeah. has an impact on their fabric choice. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's a uh, hard and fast rules are dangerous thing. They can be very helpful. Yes. But <laughs> well, and especially when talking about something as difficult to grasp as the style of patterns or designs. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, for, for everyone who loves this fabric, first of all, do whatever makes you happy in whatever mm. context, right? If, if you choose to have something that is a fabric that you love and you don't need it to be authentic for any way, I'd say go for it, right? Um, that never matters. But I find that a lot of people do sort of want to know. Like yeah. how likely would it have been? I always, in, in my own costume, costuming, I don't mean to always be authentic, but I would always like to know whether I'm choosing not to, to be, yeah. so that I'm not unauthentic because I just didn't know better, <laughs> but I'm, I'm choosing not to be. And it's always a valid choice. It's informed but, choice. So for, for people who would like to know like what, what patterns are, are really out there, I think honestly the only way to really get to that is to look at a lot of it yeah and to I fill agree. your head with images of of the things and look at the descriptions mm. because most museum collections will say whether it's european common print or indian say origin indian fabric europe uh the dress right and look at these images and, and sort of look at the dates see how they connect realize that fabrics were reused for a long time so mm. the style and cut of a garment might not always completely correspond to you know the, when the fabric originated yeah but the museums will typically say that um so they will set a date on the fabric and then set a date on the gown some do a more uh, complete more detailed job. Yes. The VNA I think so it's a very good example and they have an extensive collection of chintz and other printed cottons and they will say where it was made down to what part of india yeah. it was made um yeah and then they may they may say this was for the indonesian market or this yeah, was for exactly. the english market or this yeah. was for the dutch market and then there will be an additional date for the making of the garment and yeah. then any further alterations or updates that have been made um, so you have lots of chronology to work with that gives you i think a much more complete knowledge of the life of this object mm -hmm. that is sitting here in the year 2020 and yeah and uh, get a feeling for the global journey that it has been yeah on. yeah yeah so th i think that the rice museum is pretty good they, ha yeah. they have a good website they have a good collection website um and good search um maybe we can try to get the dutch name seats in the description so you know what to look for yes i will um, have them yeah, we'll have some because that helps because sometimes especially dutch museums they use just the dutch language tags and then it can be really difficult to search yes. if you don't don't speak the language there's um, also the mode muse um aggregate website which captures yeah. a lot of collections from a lot of different museums yeah. um, the information is sometimes quite minimal but it gives you a starting point yeah so so mono muse i i really like as a platform because it brings together collections so at least you have one place to, to search for in a foreign language instead and of their search life. their search function is 
actually works it's, fairly yeah. well too. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's fairly intuitive. Yeah. Um, and especially if you if you're looking for the fabric, mm. um, then just knowing seats will will get you a long way. And then often the collection pages will have the Dutch description, and you can see what you can translate via Google. Brilliant. This has just been wide ranging. Chins was a pretty um plus ubiquitous fabric. It it it. It was in so many different layers of society or in so many different ways and yet there, there is some rhyme, rhyme and reason to the place yeah. and time and the style yeah uh, which we're now sort of looking back trying to to pick out um with the, just the sources that we have yeah um but i think it, it's such a beautiful textile yes that people keep coming back to it yes right yes so i hope everyone enjoyed hearing a little bit more of the background and the history to this to this fabric and I think when we look at these beautiful gowns and these beautiful jackets and, and things it really um, for me it really enriches the story of that garment to know where it came from and how complicated its background and, and its story is but also how many how many people were involved and how many craftsmanship and skill was involved in all those different stages. Um, so yeah, I, 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 like I said, I, I love talking about it. <laughs> so I hope everyone uh, enjoyed hearing about it. This has been absolutely fantastic, Martha. Thank you so, so much. We will have lots of information and links for the reading and museum objects to look at all down in the description yeah. below. And we hope that this has been an interesting contribution to the COVID extravaganza and yeah. i hope that everyone has enjoyed it thank yeah. you very much bye-bye thank, bye. thank you So it's a, it's, it's a very, in that sense, a very complex history. And it's what I would like to know more about most is, is really the, the Indian instructors of the tradesmen and the craftsmen, yes. because that's really hard to get information about. Um, and there might be more available if, if you speak other languages. <laughs> um, calling chins a problematic fabric, I think, is a little bit too, too, too easy a story because it... Chins itself yeah. as a product already existed. People already traded it. People already were aware of that. The problematic part of, of chins, you can trace back to, to the European trading companies, strike for monopoly and power. Mm -hmm. um, and in group. that process, um, fought wars against indigenous populations, but it's not the common printers themselves necessarily. Mm. Um, so does does that make chins problematic? I would say not more so than general history is. Um, but it's good to be aware of sort of its role in history and things that came later. And the way it, you know, it, it contributed to wealth in other places than from where it was made. Mm. Yes. Which from our, our modern perspective, we really value giving honor and credit and the money to the people where stuff actually originates. Yeah. And that's not a concept which was around mm. um, in the 17th century. And that, that very clearly fed into how people saw it and dealt with it then. Um, yes, and it's, what's also interesting to me is that in some way it's also, it's now, if you look at current situations, it's sort of come back. Mm. Whereas current companies let their things be made there because it's cheaper, again, yes. than doing it on their own ground um, so so they they found this expensive product in India took it away from India because it was cheaper to, to produce in their own colonies yeah. elsewhere and then at some point when they lost their colonies and and their own economy had profited it they brought it back to to those places to the irony be made cheap it's yeah it's amazing um, it's a, and that now if you want good quality cotton and if you want it to be printed well in 
And then you have the whole layer for historical costuming that if you want it in a heritage or reproduction sort of design, India is where you go. Also, it has sur survived in India. It never fully, fully disappeared. No. And it wasn't being driven no. by European tastes. No, no, definitely not. And what has survived has survived really because of, of internal markets. But I think it's, it's a testament also to, to the resilience of the Indian craftsman in the sense yes. that it that it survives. And I think that's important in, in this whole story as well, um, is to maintain the agency of the people trading with yeah. the East Indian company. To, to recognize that these companies have very problematic histories mm. and at the same time not have the narrative be one of, oh, all these poor indigenous people who couldn't help themselves or, or something like that, because there were power structures yes. in Asia as well, which were never controlled in any way, right? Yeah. Um, it wasn't and, and China a and Japan are good examples of that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, these craftsmen also deserve that agency um, to some extent without saying that that sort of makes up for <laughs> atrocities no. committed elsewhere. But no. yeah. Mm -hmm. It restores their dignity, I think. Yeah. In, in people's perception, they hadn't actually lost it, but our understanding is no. to. No, yeah. Uh, and I, I think, and, and, and like I said before, I think this, um, this concept that we have now of respecting the artist. Mm -hmm. um, and, respect, and respecting craftsmanship is something that really, I think that's a mindset that really started in the late 19th century, hmm. Hmm. M more than, than it existed then, because you didn't have factories, so everything was craftsmanship. And yes, you know, um, th that, that whole arts and craft move movement grew out yes. of this desire to, to now. go back Yes. To the respect of, of the craftsmen. Um, it was being in a position to realize what you've lost and contrast. Now we have all exactly. this mechanized production and look, oh, and then look, oh, oh my goodness. Um, the yeah. artisanal <laughs> way um, has some advantages that we prefer. Yeah. <laughs> so, but from that light, it also, it, it doesn't, it makes sense that in, in, I think, 17th and 18th century, there wasn't this attention for the craftsmanship. It was really more about um, the traders who got, who got the credit and mm -hmm. that makes sense within that perspective of, of how people looked at craftsmanship within different ages and um, then we can say well now we look at that differently and now we want to tell the story of, mm -hmm. of the people who actually made this fabric and mm -hmm. highlight that and bring that forth more. So then the value really lies just in the finished product as a commodity yeah. as a trading commodity as, as goods yeah but not a value on the actual expertise in the art or the artistic I don't, I don't think so no so there were there were some chances that were signed by studios um, but they're quite rare you see more chances especially in the Netherlands which is the uh, East India Trading Company the logo like the Dutch uh, VOC stamp because they yeah. stamped all, their, all, all the things they imported about their stamp and I also, if you look at how people in Europe talked about these goods, they were called Persian, Indian, Japanese, and Chinese, all mixed up. Mm -hmm. People had no clue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and you do see references just to East India trade, uh, East India Company, East India Company yeah. goods. Yeah, uh, and they yeah, didn't make the, them, but <laughs> any marks and you know, in any accreditation tracking source had to do with tax. So it was, again, it was all about the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's very much a search for wealth and that, that's mm. what drives it. Mm. Um, and we're now changing the story from one that says that the people who produce the most wealth are, are you know, the people we should look up to towards a slightly better, uh, I would say, perspective um, that, that looks at at how they treat different people from, from different places and cultures, so. I hope so. I think yeah. a more connected world where there's a little bit more transparency or it's harder to, for, for countries that have impact on other countries, harder for them to hide what they're doing and there's more awareness or, or if not actual scrutiny, um, that yeah, yeah, there's, there is but it's, more Yes, it's level. still, you know, cl close from, from Dutch, or, or Western clothing companies, 
I mean, it's the clothing companies that get the credit, not, not the garment workers, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, so it's something that's that's very um, seems to be very hard to get rid of somehow. Yeah, um, I, that's that's a that's something that needs to be explored as well. Is the state of the fashion industry now? How much has changed in any meaningful way in in terms of who's yeah. doing the work, who's getting paid for it, how much? the conditions and the exploitation yeah. of course that that's a whole other story but i do think it's um it's interesting how by studying historical textiles and sort of mm. looking at how we view these processes with with our modern eye how much insight that can actually give us in what we're doing at the same time nowadays mm. you it's can draw the parallels there yes it's yeah. an opportunity to to have a look at what our fashion consumption and buying habits are and what what ethical or otherwise sources yeah. supply chains and all of that is yeah. things to think about mm -hmm.